Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alastair Greener. Tackling health problems every week, we're joined by a health expert within their specialised field who discusses the prevention of health issues or concerns that we or our loved ones may face. Looking at how you can change your health and lifestyle for the better, The Health Show offers an alternative viewpoint from our health experts who attend the show. And we hope that this will really help guide you in the right direction. So if you suffer from any medical issues or have any health concerns, or for that matter, if you know anybody who does, then tune in each week as we'll be covering a wide range of topics, offering alternative viewpoints from our health experts. Now, if you'd like any further information on our programmes or any of the topics that we discuss, then please do get in touch at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Again, that's healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of staying healthy in our diet and the steps that we can take to achieve a healthy lifestyle. It's a great pleasure to welcome our guest today, Jo Travers, who is a dietitian and nutritionist. She's based in London and is the author of The Low Fad Diet. Jo, lovely to see you. Hi. And you're actually with us on the first series, so great to welcome you back. Yeah, thanks for and having me. Lots of new stuff as well to talk about yep. as well. So yeah. really looking forward to that. But before I talk more with Jo, let's take a look at how French pastry chef Sébastien Godard, I'm doing my best French accent here, teaches Cuban chefs the French art of baba au Rum. Uh, but shortages on the communist island make for unique pastries with a Caribbean touch. Let's take a look. I told them that they could completely reinterpret the baba with the local products to make it their own and make it a totally Cuban product. Without doing high gastronomy, already the very principle of finding ingredients as simple as can be, as simple as in France or in Europe, I realized that it takes a very different dimension here. For us, France is the mecca of cuisine. They are famous for their cuisine, but also for their pastries. And having in Cuba Paris's Prince of Pastry is an opportunity. It's hard to get a butter. If it's hard to get cream, it's hard to get certain things. But far from being a handicap, it's something we can use to create. Now, Joe, watching people eating all of that, what looked to me to be fairly unhealthy food, is probably making you think, hmm, time for change. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything in moderation is great. You know, there's nothing wrong with cake and pastries once in a while. If you eat them all the time, then you do often start to see, you know, builds up of cholesterol or excess weight or high blood pressure or diabetes. You know, so there are things, there are health concerns with eating too much, but eating the right amount is totally fine. A little bit of what you like occasionally exactly. is pretty good. Yeah. Let's get to some real basics. First mm -hmm. of all, you know, you're a dietitian, you're a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Some people might not be familiar with those terms, so give us an idea of what that means. Sure. So a dietitian is a regulated title, so you can only call yourself a dietitian if you've done a four-year degree and you've worked in the NHS and you're regulated by the Health and Care Professions Council. So it's very strict, everything is evidence-based and everything is completely confidential. A nutritionist um, may not have the same qualifications, so it's not protected. In fact, anybody can call themselves a nutritionist, whether they've got any qualifications or not so it's always worth double checking to see whether the nutritionist you're about to see has any qualifications so and that's actually a really good point because so often we wonder are we getting the best source of information mm -hmm. because when you certainly look around nutrition you look at food we eat you know there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there you know we, we read the papers mm -hmm. that one day eggs are good for us the next day they're not good mm -hmm. for us and so on so when somebody comes to you what would they typically come to you for why would someone come to you Oh, there are so many reasons, from 
weight management. So sometimes people want to gain weight, sometimes people want to lose weight. Somebody might have diabetes or kidney disease, um, might have high blood pressure or high cholesterol, ranging all the way through to just people that want to improve their energy or improve their sleep or just feel generally better. So I see as a freelance dietitian just anybody who wants to know anything about food. And it's nice that people are starting to realise that it's actually what we consume that makes a massive difference mm -hmm. to our health. Yeah. You know, for so long, you know, people might take a tablet for a condition that they have or whatever, not that we're trying to suggest otherwise, mm -hmm. but, you know, they look in that direction rather than actually, well, what am I putting in my body mm -hmm. that makes a difference? So let's get to some real basic foundation stones of things that we should all maybe doing, be doing mm -hmm. that's going to improve our health when it comes to what we eat. So there's no getting away from the fact that we all need energy, we all need protein, and we all need vitamins and minerals, okay? So there's lots of different diets out there and things that people try all of the time. But if one of those things is missing, we're going to feel bad. They're not going to feel healthy. So energy usually comes from carbohydrates, but also fat and protein have some energy as well. Protein is used for making muscles and cells, but it's also the main ingredient of hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, the immune system. Nothing can happen without protein, and we get protein from things things like um, meat, dairy, eggs, um, beans, pulses, lentils, those kind of things. Um, and then we have foods like fruits and vegetables, whole grains, which give us vitamins and minerals and some fiber as well, which helps our, keep our gut healthy. And that actually is fiber. I mean, all those things, so many different elements there. Let's talk about through a few of those. Um, so let's first of all talk about fibre. You mentioned that last. We hear a lot about we should be having more fibre in our diet and less processed foods. Why is that? Right, so fibre is really important for helping food move through our gut, all the way through, from the mouth all the way through to the other end. And But it also, along the way, does some things. So one of the things it does is it helps to remove excess cholesterol from the body. So if you have high cholesterol, eating a bit more fibre can really help help to remove some of that and bring your cholesterol down. But one of the key things it does is it feeds the bacteria that live in our gut. And this is such a new sort of area of research that's happening now. We now know, and in fact the gut gets called the second brain because it has, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of neurons down there. They're brain cells in our gut and there's a real connection between the gut and the brain. So actually the things that we feed the bacteria that live in our gut alter the kind of the environment there and can also how, have an effect on how we feel in our brain as well. So there's a real link between stress and gut health too. When we eat refined carbohydrates, for example, so lots of white rice or white breads, you remove the fiber part from it. So actually consuming wholemeal breads and um, brown rice and things like that will really help. But pulses and beans and lentils, they contain lots of fiber, as do fruits and vegetables as well. And the more you get, the, the greater the diversity of bacteria that live in your gut that can do all of the different jobs that they do down there. So um, there was a recent study that showed that people who ate 30 different plant foods in a week had a much greater diversity in their gut bacteria than people who only ate 10. So actually, and they found that that had an impact on their health. So getting a really good variety is really important. We hear a lot about gut health. We've mm. seen the adverts on TV, and as you say, it's a very new, up-to-date subject. What about the, sort of, I guess the, you'd call them almost the alternatives to fibre? So we hear about some of these little smart drinks mm -hmm. that you can have, which apparently put back that gut health. Do those tend to work? Sometimes they do, um, but some of them don't have a lot of evidence behind them, to be honest. If you think about it, Something that's going to go through and populate your gut has to go through a lot first. So it's got to survive stomach acid and things like that. So you need to have a really good delivery system. If you're considering taking a probiotic, so that's bacteria that you drink or eat to populate your gut, it's worth going and seeing a pharmacist and just asking them which ones are the best, rather than just grabbing one from the supermarket. And that's the ch challenge for many people when it comes to nutrition, the array of food that we'll see on our supermarket yeah. shelves. It's sometimes tough to know where to start. Start. Yeah. So great. So we know we should be having more fibre mm -hmm. and you've given us lots of different things that we can have fibre in. Are there any things that maybe where people say, oh, I don't really want to have fibre because you know, it tastes like cardboard or something <laughs> like that, which I'm sure you've heard before. Yeah. What are the tastier 
fibres, which actually are really good for us, but we might not realise actually there's a massive benefit in them. Yeah, so, I mean, any kinds of fruits and vegetables. So if you like fruit, there's loads of fibre in fruits. Things like... Um, like prunes have had a real you know they've got a reputation for being really high in fiber but other fruits and vegetables are too so any of those that you like um, dried fruits too so if you add a handful of raisins to your breakfast you're increasing your fiber intake like quite considerably so it's a really good idea to kind of look around and think well how can I incorporate a bit more into my diet so choosing granary bread instead of a white bread so one with seeds in it or a wholemeal one that will have a lot more fiber than a white refined flour one will and it's always great to look at those options because often they do taste a lot lot better so actually mm -hmm often just try them and see what yep. happens. Let's come back to fruit and veg. Yep. We hear about this five a day. Some people are saying 10 a day. What's your view on that? <laughs> okay, so it's at least five, I think is probably a good place to start. Um, in this country, in the UK, it's reckoned that people get about three a day on average, which is just not enough. Yep. So the reason we need fruit and vegetables, apart from the fibre, is the vitamins and minerals as well. So every process that happens in your body requires at least one vitamin or mineral for that process to happen because they're working in reactions and sometimes those reactions won't be able to happen if you don't have that vitamin in order to make the recipe work. So you need at least five a day for that to happen and a portion is what you can fit in your cupped hand. Okay, so if you're a giant, you have giant hands, you need giant portions, okay? So whatever you can fit in your cupped hand is one, and you need at least five of those a day. And everything counts, tinned, fresh, frozen, dried, it all counts. Now that's an interesting topic as well, isn't it, about the freshness mm -hmm. of food and frozen. Before we came on air, we were actually talking a little bit about the virtues mm -hmm. of both. Talk us through that, it, you know, because sometimes people maybe aren't quite so, um, you know, kind in their words mm -hmm. they use about tinned food yeah. or frozen food but what's your view on that so when we preserve food we do alter it slightly generally so when you are preserving something in a tin you're heating it up you're cooking it you're pre-cooking it killing all the bacteria in it and it can live in a tin for you know forever almost um, but when you heat it up there is a slight decrease in some of the nutrients in there it's still good though um, with free with freezing food though you don't have that cooking so what happens is things get picked and they get frozen straight away in order to keep it fresh and that prevents any deterioration of nutrient content so when we buy something fresh from the supermarket actually it might not be as fresh as you think it might have been in a warehouse for a long time it might have flown halfway across the, the world so we don't really know how fresh those things are and the longer you keep something picked off a plant the, the more the nutrients deteriorate it is amazing so I do some I grow some of my own vegetables and stuff like that I'm fortunate that I'm able mm. to do that but the flavor is so much different mm. when it's freshly picked so you know the difference yep. between something that's maybe as you say mm -hmm. has been chilled for yep. maybe up to weeks or something yep. before you actually get to eat it Let's talk about the, the, the naughty stuff. You know, we saw okay. a little bit there on the clip and the refined foods, the cakes and so on. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of a hit list of stuff that we should be aware of <laughs> okay. and we should try and cut down. You said earlier, mm. not cut out, but what should we be cutting yeah. down on? So things that have lots of sugar in are a problem because... I mean, sugar itself is not actually that bad for us in the right amounts. If you have too much of it, though, it does become a problem for teeth, but also for your blood sugar. So when you eat large portions of carbohydrates or sweet foods, sugary foods in one go, what happens is it pushes your blood sugar up. And when your blood sugar goes above a safe level, that's a problem because it can damage the walls of the blood vessels in your eyes and kidneys and nerves. So your body will then bring blood sugar back down very sharply. And then what happens is, instead of using that energy from the sugar, it just stores it in fat cells around the middle. And that's why it's very easy to gain abdominal fat around here if you eat lots of sugar or lots of carbohydrate in one go. So the trick is, I'm going to use my hands again because they're okay. really useful for portion sizes. Because again, if you have big hands, you need big portions. Small hands, small portions. A portion of carbohydrate is about the size of your fist. Okay, So that's things like rice, bread, pasta, those kind of things. It's should be about fist size. If you have more than that, the chances of your blood sugar spiking and crashing are, are going to be higher. Now when you're thinking about things like bars of chocolate and cakes and pastries and things, that should be a rough guide as well. So stick with under, under that and try to have 
sweet foods with other foods as well. So you get some fibre in it and it slows down the release of the sugar into the bloodstream. So you don't get that spike in the first place. Because that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Because you look at some of these lovely bars in mm -hmm. the supermarket, which have got nuts and mm -hmm. things. You think, oh, this is all good for me. This is all great. But actually, there's a huge amount of sugar sometimes in those, aren't there? There can be. It's always worth checking the ingredients list. If glucose or sugar or fructose or one of those things that ends in O's <laughs> comes first, that means it's the main ingredient. So try and look for one that's got oats or nuts for, as the first ingredient. And oats and nuts in a cereal bar actually are brilliant because they've got lots of fibre in them. And they, like I said, they slow the release of the carbohydrate, slow the release of the sugar into the bloodstream. So instead of getting a sugar spike, it's a much more gradual rise. Yeah, and it's quite interesting, isn't it, when you, when you look at the labels because... We, we've seen a lot of work in the news about the changing labels, trying to help <laughs> people understand them better. Yeah. In, in, in your view, is that actually a reasonably good guide to see how much fat <clears throat> you're consuming, how much sugar and how much salt and things? It is good. It's nice to be able to compare products as well. So you can see two products and if you're looking at the traffic light la label on the front, whether it's red, orange or green, you're able to tell whether it's a good amount of sugar, fat or salt compared to one that's perhaps not. So try and avoid the red ones <laughs> as much as possible. Occasionally it's totally fine, but if most of the time what you're doing is picking products that have the green traffic lights on, then you know that for the most part you're getting something that's fairly healthy. You talked about uh, people struggling with their weight, and I know that's a big issue for many mm. people. And a lot of them will say, but I feel hungry. Mm -hmm. I feel hungry all the time. I feel like I need to eat. Are there things which are natural appetite suppressants, are there natural ways of ensuring that you don't feel as hungry? Fibre, again, we're back to fibre. Right. So plenty of fibre is really, really important. But also getting the right amount of protein. So if you don't eat enough protein, it's a problem because your body needs protein in order to function properly. So if you're not giving it the ingredients it needs, it sends a message saying, you're hungry, you need to eat again. But the other thing to be aware of is the balance between carbohydrates and protein. So carbohydrates, like I said before, is where we get our energy from. So that's things like bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, and if you don't eat enough of those, that can leave you hungry too. So getting the balance right is important. So that fist-sized por portion of carbohydrates, a palm-sized portion of, of protein, and a couple of handfuls of vegetables is really what we're looking for at meal times. Now, this is going to sound a bit strange, but if you eat large portions of carbohydrates, like maybe two fist-sized, three fist-sized portions, when that spikes your blood sugar and crashes, you can then can be hungry again. So even eating too much carbohydrate can make you feel hungry. So it's getting that balance right. It's a little bit of a balancing act, but what I like to suggest is if you think about your plate and you split it into three and you fill half your plate with vegetables or a mixture of fruit and veg, a quarter with protein and a quarter with carbohydrates in combination with those hand-sized measures, you'll be fine. And possibly even a smaller plate than you would normally have as well. Mm. What about exercise? Because, again, you talked about balance. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we recognise that what we put in versus what we put out mm -hmm. in terms of energy and things. How much difference does exercise make to your ability to maybe have a little bit more food than you, than yeah. you should? Yeah, so, I mean, exercise can make you hungry. It can but it helps your body function properly. So we know now that sitting is one of the worst things that we can do. So I've got a fitness tracker and it, every um, hour, if I haven't stood up for enough and moved around, it sends me a little alarm saying, stand up, we might go off in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sitting too much is a problem, but exercise can really help everything keep moving. So it can help your digestive system, it can help your brain, it can just help everything you know, flow more easily, it can help with inflammation, it keeps everything moving around the body so actually doing some exercise although it might make you hungrier can actually give you much more energy and that's really really important and mm -hmm. obviously we know the benefits of exercise mm -hmm. through a multitude of, of, of different reasons 
coming back to the foods that we should or shouldn't eat, you talked about sugar there. Mm -hmm. Another food that we hear a lot about in the news at the moment is salt. Yes. And I know that for a lot of our audience mm -hmm. who come from the South Asian communities, salt is a big ingredient. Mm -hmm. So salt has always been really important to all sorts of cultures in their cooking. It's a flavour enhancer, so it makes food taste really good. But also it can preserve food too. So lots of um, processed foods use salt as a preservative in order for us to be able to keep it for longer. So it has its really important uses, but if you have too much of it, it's a problem because what it does over long periods of time is it reduces the elasticity of your blood vessels. So at the moment, what should happen is your heart pumps, the blood goes through the blood vessels and they stretch like that in order to let it through. But when you have too much salt over long periods of time, it stops them from being stretchy anymore. That builds up pressure and that's what causes high blood pressure. And that's a risk for things like stroke and heart disease and heart attacks. So trying to reduce the amount of salt is a really good idea. Really what we're looking for is about one teaspoon of salt over the whole day. And if you do person. your own cooking, you know how much you're putting exactly. in. And we're going to talk more about that mm -hmm. later on, as well as mental health mm -hmm. and also uh, children as well. But for the moment, thank you very much indeed, Jo. Uh, we'll talk to Joe more in the second half, but I must now stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. As you heard, lots more to talk about. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is staying healthy. And with me is dietitian Joe Travers. We've talked lots about nutritious foods and what we should be eating, but what about exercise? Is it just as important as what we consume? We're going to have a look at a group of women trained in Madani Kel, a form of Indian martial arts, who showcase their swashbuckling skills that have landed them roles as extras in the new Bollywood movie Mani Karnika, the Queen of Jansi. Let's take a look. Every girl that they should learn these art forms because they are a very good form of self-defense. We were standing right next to Kangana, running amid horses and holding swords. We were her army. It felt very good. It's very energetic for us. Coming here and lifting up the instruments make me feel very different and happy. It feels good. We hope that people who might be forgetting this art form will remember it. We want it to receive prominent recognition nationwide. Well, Joe, we saw some extreme exercise there. Mm. Now, we're not advocating necessarily that people take that much exercise, but maybe taking up a, a sport or a hobby like that or something maybe a little less mm. strenuous is actually great, isn't it? It is, and it should be something that you enjoy. So if you enjoy going and running for you know, an hour on the treadmill, fine, carry on. But for most people, they need something a little bit more interesting. And, you know, joining a class or something like that. I have a client who's just started doing bell ringing. <laughs> and they, you know, it's been brilliant for them. And they're really strong and they've, you know, become really energetic because of it. So finding something that you really like is a great way to start. But even doing 10 minutes of walking a day will have a big impact compared to doing nothing. So it doesn't have to be extreme or anything as much as that or energetic as that just even just moving around is really key and especially we noticed there that you know the, that was very much women involved in mm -hmm. that particular sport and these days with women only gyms and a lot of different facilities where women can feel yeah. more comfortable taking exercise because that's really important because it was often seen the gym as the domain of men and mm -hmm. things like that the fact that there are so many more options for women today yeah. is really positive and also um 
particularly for women who are postnatal. So you can take your baby along to classes and things like that. There's creches and things for the children. Lots of schools now are doing exercise classes after you drop, them off, off, drop the kids off at school for women. So there are lots of new places that you can explore these things, definitely. And one of the big things it does, taking exercise, has a, a, a huge benefit to your mental health, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it can do, definitely. So, I mean, it's interesting because they called this a martial art. And the art form is really important. You know, you do something and you do it well and you enjoy it. And that really has huge benefits for, you know, yes, for your health and for your muscles, but your brain as well. So when you enjoy something and you get those endorphins, it's really beneficial. We've heard a lot about uh, mental health um, over the last couple of years. It's it's and quite right too. It's really come to the forefront of, of all the news stories that we hear about today. When it comes to nutrition, people often think mental health is something about a state of mind, but actually a lot of that stems back to what we eat, doesn't it? Give us a bit more of an idea about that. So at the very basic um, level, we are what we eat. So there's a biological, you know, component to how we feel. So if your brain cells are not made of the right things because you haven't eaten well, that's a problem. So usually um, brain cells need to be made of omega-3. So this is a particular oil that we can't make in our body and we have to get it through our diet. It's found in oily fish like salmon and mackerel, but also in things like seeds, um, flax seeds and walnuts if you're vegetarian. So having these oils are really important because your brain, it allows your brain to make them into cells. Now this particular oil is very fluid at body temperature and it allows all of those chemical messengers in your brain to get through into the center of the cell. If you don't have enough of these omega-3s, your body substitutes with other kinds of fat, which maybe don't do the job as well. So on that really fundamental, you know, biological level, we have that going on. But then there's also the psychological aspect of food on your mood. So we have celebrations, for example, fasting and feasting. They involve food and they have really positive connotations. But sometimes you can, can tip over into things like comfort eating. So when you've had a bad day, you eat ice cream or whatever your particular comfort food is. Now that is fine if you genuinely feel comforted by it. If it makes you feel better, that is brilliant. But what can often happen is it can tip over into feeling guilty or wishing you hadn't eaten it. And in that case, trying to respond to that and notice it and think about treating yourself well rather than treating yourself with food. So instead of, you know, getting some ice cream on the way home because you feel bad, you know, think, oh, what could I do to actually really treat myself well rather than just having a shortcut to these festive things that we might do? And because and, they often don't work. So it's like a two pronged approach, really eating sensibly, eating well, giving your body the ingredients it needs to make your cells, but also, and to, to run all of the different, you know, systems and services that your body is doing for you all of the time. So getting plenty of vitamins and minerals that help those neural pathways to be formed is really important. And it, 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 as you say, it makes a massive difference. You know, people often say we are what we eat mm -hmm. and that's body and mind. Yeah. And it all really starts with developing good habits with mm -hmm. children. Children. What's your advice to parents who are trying to do the right thing with their children, but of course they're passing fast food outlets and mm -hmm. tempted by all of that. How do you bring that balance in with children so they're starting their lives with good nutrition? I mean, I think it sort of goes back to that thing that I was saying at the beginning, we all need energy, we all need protein and we all need vitamins and minerals. So if you think about that plate model that I was discussing before where you fill half of your plate with vegetables or a mixture of fruit and veg, a quarter with carbs and a quarter with protein, that works really well for children too. And if they're still hungry after that, they can have an extra snack and that kind of thing. But trying to bring as much food into the home as possible. So you sit around a table and you eat together and cooking is something that you do with your children. All of that helps them to go forward into their own lives doing those things for their children as well. And it has a real positive impact on the generations below you. What about routine and you know, having habits when it comes to food? Is it something that the, that the body learns and therefore you get used to it having certain foods which are actually better for you than maybe the ones that aren't so good for you? Definitely. So there's lots and lots of research that says, that, that show us that if you don't particularly like a food 
actually, after several tries, maybe 10 or 20 tries, your body will accept that and you will actually like it. I mean, I've had this <laughs> with my daughter as well. So she really, really hated courgettes. <laughs> and I just fed them to her again and again and again. And now she loves them. She absolutely loves them. She's eight now. And my son, who is five, he is now going through a bit of a fussy stage. But, you know, I just stick with it. They eat what we eat and I put it down. If they don't eat it, they'll go hungry for a day but they learn they learn it and it is a really important part of growing up you know we teach them how to be young adults and you know part of that is teaching them how to eat well and it's interesting that you were talking about you know gathering around a table and eating a meal together which of course is something that people struggle to do yes. so much these days yeah. but actually cooking as well from mm. scratch how much benefit is there by doing that rather than buying a ready meal or something else so there's quite a few benefits. So on the very basic level, you know what is going into it. You are in control of what goes into your food. So there won't be fillers and preservatives and things like that that you don't really know they don't really look like food. They're there for reasons of, you know, because somebody wants to sell it to you and it needs to stay on a shelf. When you cook yourself, it's a really um, basic procedure and you can really monitor what's going into it. But also, there's another aspect to it. So it can be quite mindful, like the idea of slowing down and taking some time to make something delicious that you're going to feed your body. It's really nourishing. It's a nourishing process and not everybody has time to do it every day. I definitely don't every day. But when I can, I really do. So I always try and make at least, you know, three days a week where we all sit down together at the table. And yeah, and obviously there's the mental aspect yeah, to that so as well, of actually being, being together. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people often say is, I just can't help but snack. You know, have a little snack here, a little snack there. Again, how easy is it to train our minds and bodies not to snack as much or to maybe snack on something a little bit healthier. Mm. So snacks can be your best friend or your worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're eating very sugary things or things that are not, uh, you know, full of salt, for example, that's not going to be really very good for us. And it may not even quench our hunger. So if you are hungry and you feel like you need a snack, it's good to eat some food that will actually give your body what it needs. So having balanced snacks, like having a couple of different food groups can work really well. So for example, you might have cheese and crackers or yogurt and fruit and that way you get some protein and you get some fiber and you get some vitamins and minerals and you're covering all bases rather than just having a bar of chocolate or a biscuit which is just going to give you some sugar some energy without any of the protein or the fiber added to it so if you are hungry it is a good idea to eat something but do, try not to just go for the quickest thing that you can. If, you know, if you're going to a vending machine, try and get some nuts and raisins rather than a bar of chocolate or a bag of crisps. The nutrition is often seen as just something that's quite nice to do well, but it's not necessarily that important. But I know for you as a dietitian and nutritionist, you've seen some dramatic turnabouts in people's health just because they've changed what they've been eating. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could give us just an idea of a couple of people, a couple of patients or clients that you've worked with who've actually seen some remarkable transformations because they've changed the way they eat. Yeah, so often when I see people in clinic, particularly for things like weight management or eating disorders, people are coming to me and they're feeling really, really down about themselves. They don't really like the way they are living and actually it kind of starts with food we do a bit of reassurance and you know they start to eat well they eat right portions those kind of things and the next time they come back to see me they've lost some weight they're feeling more they're feeling more energetic they're sleeping better they you know they can concentrate at work and that has a positive impact so we end up with this positive spiral and I've got this one client I mean she's absolutely amazing she's a lawyer she used to be really really awful at eating and she would go long periods of time without eating and then just eat loads of rubbish and you know takeaway foods and things like that and now she just has a system she wakes up in the morning she has her breakfast she takes a snack with her if she's busy in court you know she'll have it just as soon as she finishes and you know she's lost lots of weight she's feeling really energetic she goes swimming three times a week now so there's definitely huge improvements you can have just by starting small, eating better. And it's interesting you're saying that that particular client of yours had developed a system. Yeah. Is that the sort of thing that you help them with? It is nice if you can have a system. You just get into the habit. So at first, 
it's a little bit of an effort to kind of think, OK, what am I going to eat? When am I going to do it? How do I need to take it? When do I need to shop for it? But that bit at the beginning is actually really only a few weeks until you're in, you've got new habits, and those are just the way you live now. So although at the beginning it's a little bit of effort and, you know, that's what I encourage them with, but soon enough people just take that and they can run with it. And it's interesting you say about the habits because I, I read somewhere that a, you do something for about 30 times it becomes a habit mm -hmm. and developing better habits. Now for people, and especially we know from talking to some of our viewers, um, you know, who come from a culture where there's always food, mm -hmm. it's a wonderfully hospitable culture, how can you help people in those situations to actually just be eating a little bit less, a little bit more healthy, especially if, they, if there are cultural reasons that they're eating maybe mm. a bit more and eating maybe the foods that aren't the best for them? So I think it is about moderation. So when you are presented with a whole array of delicious foods, it's about taking a little bit of each thing, listening to your stomach, listening to your, your hunger and your satiety signal. So when you feel when you don't feel hungry anymore that's when you should stop eating so that's a really good sign so it's not really a feeling of fullness if you've eaten until you're full it's a little bit too much so you should stop when you're no longer hungry so it's just about thinking actually what tastes good right now as well so your brain will be telling you this tastes brilliant the first mouthful you have but then actually after a little while that feeling drops off and it stops being so tasty I do this really funny thing in clinic with people where I say you can eat as much chocolate as you want and some people find that quite frightening but you know actually there, there becomes a time when actually after maybe the fourth or fifth it stops being as delicious and then it can tip over into actually this isn't that nice anymore and it's about being mindful about it so being there in the moment enjoying it while it's going into your mouth and then stopping when you've had enough and it stops being so enjoyable. And that's a really, really good tip. And again, you work with lots of different clients. And being a dietitian, you see many different things. Mm -hmm. You see people with all sorts of conditions which are often related to health. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about some of them? So I see clients um, for all sorts of nutrition-related conditions. So on the one hand, it might be something that somebody that's trying to recover from surgery, for example, and they need extra protein. But then often it's um, on the other end of the scale, if somebody has diabetes, for example, that's very diet rela related, particularly type 2 diabetes. So we'll be looking at managing carbohydrate intake and, and that kind of thing. And then sometimes if, it's got, if diabetes has gone on to kidney disease, you have to be very strict with the, with the diet then. And that's why I always tell people if, if you have diabetes, just manage it really well because if it goes on to cause kidney disease, then you haven't got any choices about what you eat. You just have to eat what you're told. <laughs> And it's really interesting actually hearing you say that, that it makes a big difference. Mm. And obviously those are often diseases we associate with people getting older. Mm -hmm. So what about our, our nutrition and dietary habits as we get older? Are the changes we should be making? You, you hear about older people not being able to eat as late as they once could, eat as much as they once mm -hmm. could. So how do our bodies change as we get older? I mean, there's different nutritional needs at every stage of life. So children need lots and lots of energy because they're growing and running around a lot. As they get to teenagers, you need to have lots of calcium so that they can get their peak bone mass in, ready for adulthood. And then as you start to get older, perhaps um, reaching the menopause, and as men get a little bit older as well, your need for nutrients goes up but your need for energy comes down. So you have to concentrate a lot harder on the things that you eat and eat less sugary things and less high fat foods and concentrate more on things like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So those things become really, really important as the body becomes less efficient at working. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, and it's tough, isn't it? Yeah. When you get older, you know, you hear all the time about the fact that you don't need energy, but we're still probably consuming the same exactly. as we were. For somebody who might be watching, thinking, I know I should make some changes, I know I should be doing something, but I just can't get that first step. How do you deal with that when somebody, is, they sort of know, but they just can't motivate themselves to yeah. take um, that first step? Motivation is quite important. And if somebody is already thinking about making changes, that's a really good sign. But I would say go and see a health professional. So somebody like me, everything is completely confidential. It's just you and me in a room together. And everything is evidence-based. And we can explore different ways of, you know, working, making small 
small changes that will actually have a really big difference. So everything is kind of, you know, at your own pace. You know, even going to see a GP, they can really help you in, you know, to, to kind of come up with something that would help you without it being too difficult. It is, as you say, that it's, it's that first step. And are there just little things you can maybe do straight away? You know, what, what would be your top tips of little small changes that actually can make a big difference? I think portion sizes are really important because it's very easy to eat too much or too little or not enough of one thing and too much of the other. So getting that balance right is probably the first thing. And there's an infinite amount of fine tuning you can do to a diet. But it's the big stuff that really counts. So if you can get the right amount of carbohydrates and protein and fruits and vegetables, actually everything feels a lot easier. Your body works properly. And then you might have time to, you know, think about all of the little tiny little things that you can do to make it even better. We hear a lot about superfoods. You know, everything seems to be a superfood. There's, you know, one fat after another. What sort of evidence is there behind these superfoods and the fact that they can really help? So superfoods is, yeah, it's not a technical term. And it's not <laughs> one that the, science, that the science community usually uses. Um, but what it means, it's kind of become a phrase for a food that's really high in nutrients. So you get a lot of bang for your buck. So things like berries, for example, or kale and spinach, those things that have got lots of dark colours in them. They have what we call phytonutrients and it comes back to fibre again as well. So these particular foods, they tend to have lots of different fibres in them and lots of different plant chemicals that can actually really help with things like inflammation in our body and feeding the bacteria that help us stay healthy. So that, that's generally the, the t where the term comes from, really, really high nutrient density. But for me, I would say probably beans and lentils and pulses are probably, you know, the only food that I would really call super because they've got protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, fibre. They've got loads and loads of stuff in them. So I always try and include some beans in my day. Brilliant. And again, thinking about you as a dietitian and nutritionist, do you have people coming to you? And there might be some people watching thinking, yeah, well, what, what happens when I come to you? Do you start sort of really sort of ripping my diet apart and saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing this? Give us an idea of the process of someone coming to see someone like yourself and where you take them in terms of their sort of better health journey. Mm -hmm. So I always start by figuring out where people are now. So I ask them to talk me through a typical day. So what they eat, but also also how food fits into their day and then from that we can see you know where we can make a few changes to help them get to their goals so if somebody is really busy has no time to cook I won't suggest that you know they start getting a load of cookery books out and cooking because it's not going to fit in with their lifestyle so we look at you know healthier options that they can do within what they can manage so it's always about the client you know what they can do what they're trying to achieve and then we come up with little ways that aren't that aren't too hard that's the key, isn't yeah. it? So it's, yeah. it's not, not too difficult. And then once people get into the swing of it and they feel so much better, they want to carry on and then you can make big changes. Having that support of someone that you can go to, as you said, confidentially, is a massive part of improving one's health often, isn't it? It is because it's, I mean, we're bombarded with so much information now and you don't know if you can trust all of it. And some of it is really conflicting and it depends on your health perspective. So there's all sorts of things. If you are not very well or have a health condition the advice might be completely different to somebody who is actually quite well and just wants to improve their their energy levels or whatever so going and seeing somebody who knows what they're talking about in a confidential and safe and welcoming space can be really it can be brilliant and again you talk about going to see people you mentioned at the beginning of the show a dietitian is the only formal qualification. Mm -hmm. How can someone, apart from seeing that they're a dietitian, how can they work out who's the best person to go and see? Mm -hmm. Apart from you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of nutritionists also do have qualifications. So look for somebody who's a Bachelor of Science. So if they have BSc after their name, that means that they've done a degree. But also going via your GP is great because your GP is like the gatekeeper to all of the different health professionals so they can refer Brilliant. 
Thank you so much indeed. It's been great okay. chatting to you. We've learned a huge amount as well. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I'd like to thank our guest dietitian and nutritionist, Joe Travers, for coming into the show and discussing the importance of health eating and giving us lots and lots of tips. But once again, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or any health concerns, it's always highly recommended you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. If you'd like to find out more about this or any of the subjects we've been talking talk about on the show, please do email us at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Again, that's healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Join us next week for another fascinating health show. Goodbye for now. Assalamu alaikum.